great day. So a year or so ago, several members of the organization were privileged to hear our Proctor Forum speaker at the Basilica of St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception in Norfolk, Virginia, where she addressed the audience about the possible historical significance of a tunnel found under the church during its recent $7 million renovation. There was speculation that the tunnel and the church may have been a way station in the Underground Railroad helping escaped slaves to find freedom. The potential discovery was particularly poignant because the Basilica of St. Mary is the only predominantly African-American basilica in the United States. Our speaker's remarks were so captivating and enlightening that it was decided to invite her to a Proctor Forum speaker and she graciously accepted. Our speaker is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and a professor of history at Norfolk State University. A noted specialist in African-American and Virginia history, she is the author and co-author of Virginia Waterways and the Underground Railroad and in African-American history of the Civil War and Hampton Roads, among other works. She also co-edited Voices from Within the Veil, African Americans and the Experience of Democracy, and has contributed articles in numerous journals and books, including In Search of the Twenty and Odd, Reclaiming the Humanity of America's First Africans in the Virginia Colony. In Engaging the African Dis uh, Diaspora in K-12 Education, and Laura E. Davis Titus, Feminine Leadership in the Freedom's First Generation in Women Claiming Freedom, Gender, Race, and Liberty in the Americas. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor uh, to announce that the next words that you're going to hear will be the words from Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And it is absolutely my pleasure to talk about um, one of my favorite subjects, uh, a subject in which so many people in Hampton Roads are unaware of and that is the Underground Railroad. So thank you so much for an opportunity to talk about this topic. Hello, I'm Cassandra Newby Alexander, and I'd like to welcome you to my presentation on the Underground Railroad in Hampton Roads and those freedom seekers who sought freedom and liberty through the Underground Railroad. One of the most exciting things is to talk about the Underground Railroad in part because it is still a work in progress. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. But I want to begin with one of the numerous stories that I've uncovered as I have done work on the Underground Railroad. And one of them is the story of Isaac Foreman, William Davis, and Willis Reddick. Now, these three men escaped in 1853. Hello, I'm Cassandra Newby Alexander, and I'd like to welcome you to my presentation on the Underground Railroad in Hampton Roads and those freedom seekers who sought freedom and liberty through the Underground Railroad. One of the most exciting things is to talk about the Underground Railroad in part because it is still a work in progress. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. But I want to begin with one of the numerous stories that I've uncovered as I have done work on the Underground Railroad. And one of them is the story of Isaac Foreman, William Davis, and Willis Reddick. Now, these three men escaped in 1853 aboard one of the steamships that frequented the waterways in Hampton Roads. In fact, Norfolk in particular was the center of activities of the Underground Railroad. 
And that's because hundreds of ships every single year plied the waterways and they went back and forth from Richmond to Norfolk. And Norfolk, of course, would go to Philadelphia with the steamships. It would also go to Boston. But there were also hundreds and hundreds of schooners that went back and forth, not only to those locations, but especially to New Bedford, Massachusetts, as well as to Delaware. And so this was the hub of so much maritime industry. And in fact, for those who may not know, Norfolk was designated by King Charles of England in 1680 to be the port of Virginia. And that's why so much maritime activity happened here, both in terms of the domestic slave trade with the majority of people in Virginia leaving from the Norfolk port and going to Charleston and to New Orleans uh, to be sold as property to other people but it was also the primary departure point for people headed to points north seeking freedom, both in this country and northern cities like Philadelphia, New Bedford, Boston, Syracuse, and other places, but also going to Canada, whether it was to Halifax, Nova Scotia, in that area, or whether it was to the Ontario province, especially to the big city Toronto, which was of course the capital for uh, even in that time period that we're talking about. And that's any time between 1830 and 1860. But back to this story. So I wanted to read you an excerpt from a section in William Still's book on the Underground Railroad. And William Still, I'll tell you about him a little bit I'll tell you a little bit more about him shortly, but William Still was a station master on the Underground Railroad and he was in Philadelphia. And what he wrote was the following. These passengers, meaning Isaac Foreman, William Davis and Willis Reddick, all arrived together, concealed per steamship city of Richmond, December, 1853. Isaac Foreman, the youngest of the party, 23 years of age and a dark mulatto, would be considered by a Southerner capable of judging as very likely. He fled from a widow by the name of Mrs. Sanders. He stated that he had a wife living in Richmond and that she was confined the morning he took the Underground Railroad. Of course, he could not see her. The privilege of living in Richmond with his wife had been denied him. Thus fearing to render her unhappy, he was obliged to conceal from her his intention to escape. Now we know that the three men left aboard a steamship, the city of Richmond, that looked very similar to this ship, the steamship Augusta. And I wanted to show you this picture so that you had an idea of what the steamship looked like. Now, of course, a steamship meant it was fueled by either wood or coal. And so there was a huge boiler room and above that boiler room was a compartment that was usually used to put anybody who was escaping in that compartment. Often it was a um, what we call a conductor or someone who simply worked as an agent with the Underground Railroad. Now on the city of Richmond, there was a young man by the name of John Minkins. He was a free black from Norfolk and he reportedly helped hundreds of people throughout this region of, of not only Hampton Roads, but as far north as Richmond, uh, leave aboard that particular steamship. And eventually he became a schooner captain, continuing his activities, helping freedom seekers find freedom in the north. So it was this kind of steamship on which the three men escaped. Now the question is, who were these men and why did they escape? Well, I told you a little bit in this excerpt about Isaac Foreman, but let me tell you a little bit more. So Isaac Foreman actually worked aboard the Augusta and this steamship went back and forth between Norfolk and Richmond. 
and then of course it would go to Philadelphia. And so it wasn't unusual for these steamships to actually hire out enslaved men to work aboard the ships. In fact, in the South, most of the industries uh, hired out people who were enslaved to work in that industry, whether it was hotels, taverns, uh, along the, the docks as, as uh, loaders and unloaders, um, seamen aboard ships, uh, those who helped to ferry people back and forth between the trains and the ships and the hotels and all of that, um, ferries. Uh, African Americans were a part of and integrated fully into the industries in the South. And of course, in Richmond, where you had the Tredegar Ironworks factory, or um, anywhere else where you had uh, sawmills, uh, tobacco factories, and so forth, African Americans worked in those industries. Tredegar Ironworks factory actually owned close to 100 enslaved people. And so it was not unusual to see African Americans aboard these ships working. And so what this did was it created a security issue for Virginia. In fact, there were a number of lawmakers who began to articulate their, their high level of concern by the 1850s when it seems that the Underground Railroad Network was helping hundreds and hundreds of people escape, which meant that millions of dollars was being lost to the slaveholders throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so in this case, in the case of Isaac Foreman, he was going back and forth between Richmond and Norfolk. And, um, and that's how he met his wife. She also was enslaved. And so it was with the consent of his owner or the ship's captain and her owner as to how much he would see his wife. And so what he did was he uh, contacted he um, uh, one of the uh, one of the stewards, John Minkins, uh, who was also working on a similar ship, and he told them he wanted to escape. And part of the reason was because he did not want to see uh, either his wife or any future children be sold into slavery. He could not fathom. Uh, being able to live with that. And he thought it would be easier to escape. And, but once he reached to uh, Philadelphia first, meeting William Still, and then ended up uh, going up to Toronto along with the other two men, he found that he couldn't live without his wife. In fact, I wanted to read you just a little bit of a letter that he wrote to his wife and it was William Still who um, actually got the letters to his wife. And that's because there was this incredible network that was there. And so while he was waiting to hear back from William Still and possibly his wife, he, wrote, he, he got a job in a hotel. And this is the hotel that he worked in. It was called the Russell Hotel. It was one of the most famous, popular hotels in Toronto. So he was right in the mix of, of the main operations in Toronto. And so he wrote to William Still, and as I said, hoping to uh, get his letters to his wife and he actually fell into a deep depression. And he wrote that he was, quote, very gloomy in his heart. His heart was almost breaking about his wife. He said, my soul is vexed. My troubles are inexpressible. I, I often feel as if I were willing to die. I must see my wife in short. If not, I will die. What would I not give no tongue can utter? Just to gaze on her sweet lips one moment, I would be willing to die the next. I am determined to see her sometime or the other. Well, 
as it turns out with some of my research, I found out that he did indeed see his wife. In fact, his letters got to her and he had to wait a little bit because she did actually get pregnant or she was pregnant when he left. It doesn't seem as if the child survived, um, but she was able to get to Canada and they had additional children. And we see them in the records in which they lived um, uh, until what they call a ripe old age, which was in the latter part of their 60s. They lived a life. He, he actually opened up several businesses. They had, as I said, several children. And he worked to help other people settle, who were freedom seekers, settle in Toronto and in the areas around. Now, the other men, uh, I mentioned uh, William, and I also mentioned Willis. They also tried to get their wives out because both of them were about to be sold into slavery. And that seems to be what motivated those two people. They thought, if I, if I escaped myself, then I could, from my vantage point, being free, or at least living as a free person, I could perhaps exert some influence to get my family out. What we don't know is whether or not they ever succeeded. But I will say that we're continuing to check the records and see if we can locate these others. But there was another man, interestingly, James Foreman. He was the brother, the younger brother of Isaac Foreman. And we know that he too escaped. And he wrote this letter that you see in 1856 to William Still. And I wanted to read you this. He says, sir, and, and I hope you see, these were enslaved people who knew how to read and write. We know in fact in Norfolk, that Norfolk, the, the Norfolk officials actually passed an ordinance to demand that the postmaster general stop delivering abolitionist newspapers to the enslaved population in the 1840s. And so that surprised me on two counts. First of all, that they knew what was happening and that the postmaster had actually delivered abolitionist newspapers to enslaved people. Who would have thought? These people knew how to read and write. And that was also a security threat because some of them were able to write passes for themselves. So he says, I take pen in hand to write you these few lines to let you know that I am, I am well at present and hope these few lines may find you the same. Now you'll notice that there are a few words that are misspelled, but that was very typical of this time period. Sir, my object in writing to you is that I, that I expect a young lady by the name of Miss Mariah Moore from Norfolk, Virginia. She will leave Norfolk on the 13th of this month in the steamship Virginia for Philadelphia. You will oblige me very much by seeing her safely on the train of cars that leaves Philadelphia for the suspension bridge, Niagara Falls. Please to tell the lady to telegraph to me what time she will leave Philadelphia so I may know what time to meet her at the suspension bridge. My brother Isaac Foreman, send his love. Also his family to you and your family. They are all well at present. Please to give my respects to Mr. Harry Londe, also Miss Margaret Cunningham, no more at present. Now, of course, we found out that these last two people that he's referencing, Mr. Harry Londe, is really Mr. Henry Lundy. And Miss Margaret Cunningham was Miss uh, Olgavy. And of course, it was Mary Olgavy who became Mary Levest. And both of those individuals were members of St. Patrick's Church, Catholic Church in Norfolk, that later would become St. Mary's Basilica. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a minute. Anyway, he says, when you telegraph to me, direct to the International Hotel in Niagara Falls, New York. Well, what we know is that Mariah was transported all the way to Niagara. And just like in a movie, the oh, 
is that Moriah was trans A week later, the two were married in an Anglican church in Canada. And of course, that's where they lived the rest of their lives. And so these stories are powerful. They are telling about the people who lived and died, the people who risked everything for freedom. And so I, I wanted to kind of tell you a little bit to, to get you thinking about these individuals. In fact, one of those who escaped said that slavery was designed to break hearts and to tear out the soul. So what was the motivation for people leaving? Of course, the, the whole point was they were enslaved, but what motivated them to risk their lives? Because if they were caught, they might not be sold, but their family members might be sold or beaten or even killed. This fear of separation from family through sale or inheritance was a powerful motivator. And many thought that they could be in a position to leave if they got away themselves and they were able to use their connections to help get their family out. In fact, many of you have probably heard about Henry Brown, known as Henry Box Brown. He was a man who lived in Richmond and he hired out his own time, which allowed him to slowly raise enough money and he sought to purchase the freedom of his wife who was owned by someone else. And he raised enough money, negotiated with the owner uh, as to what he would take um, in exchange for her freedom. And when he gave him the money and he said, okay, so where are her free papers? The owner said, what money? You didn't pay me any money. And so the owner swindled him out of his money. And then he worked very, very hard to raise more money. And instead of going directly to the owner, he went to an attorney hoping that the attorney would uh, uh, proctor the sale. And then the attorney stole his money from him. He was in the process of raising money a third time when, her, when his wife's owner sold her away. And Henry Brown, in, in his account, tells a story of how he held the hand of his wife as she was led off in a coffle gang to a sh and boarded a, a ship. And he held her hand until they drove him away with whips. He was so despondent that he thought about killing himself for months. And finally, he contacted a white carpenter who constructed a box for him based on his specifications. And then he contacted a person who was involved in the Underground Railroad and arranged to have this box sealed and sent to the abolitionists led by uh, William Still in Philadelphia. And he carried with him a few instruments and a cup of water so that he could survive because, of course, the box could not have any holes in it. It couldn't have any way for somebody to look into that box to see that there was a human being in it. And he put in big, bold letters this side up with arrows pointing up. Well, he got in the box, they nailed him in, and he he had an instrument to bore tiny air holes for himself. Why? Because he could suffocate after two days in this box. Of course, halfway through the journey, the box was moved to another ship and turned upside down. And so for the rest of the journey, he was for close to 24 hours upside down. When the ship reached Philadelphia and the abolitionists came to get the box. They did not open it up on the docks for two reasons. The first one 
is that they open the box with all the potential slave catchers around, that person would have been caught. Secondly, because they had opened boxes like that previously, some of the people died. They either uh, starved to death or um, were without air or something else happened. And so they didn't want people to see that. And there's one picture that you see uh, and the Library of Congress owns that picture of, of supposedly Henry Box Brown jumping out of the box and you see some people gathered around the box. Well, the artist who did this rendering didn't know what William Still looked like and didn't know what Henry Brown looked like. And the only people he knew, or the only black person he knew because it was a white artist was Frederick Douglass. And so you have this image of variations of Frederick Douglass, both as a person jumping out of the box and a person looking at supposedly Henry Brown jumping out of the box. So that's, that tells you that separation from family was perhaps one of the strongest motivators of people who escaped. Another one was harsh treatment or their involvement in the Underground Railroad because you did have a number of conductors who were enslaved in the South um, who operated this Underground Railroad network who were found out and they had to flee. You also had the last two, and that is a desire for freedom, and as, as well as the death of a slaveholder, which really meant that if their slaveholder died, any agreements that were made were probably not respected. Um, and we also know that often the person would be sold away to someone else far away. Now, I wanted to show you this map because the way that we see today Virginia and especially Hampton Roads and this whole area along the Eastern Seaboard in Virginia is from the perspective of the roads. But we don't see it from the perspective of the waterways. And we don't understand really how intricate and impactful and powerful those waterways have been in the history of this region. Of course, in Hampton Roads, you can't drive more than a couple of miles without passing over uh, a bridge or pa driving over a bridge or going through a tunnel. Uh, and a lot of the roads, you're actually traveling over bridges, but it's built into the road. So you don't even know that you're driving over bridges. If you go to downtown Norfolk, half of downtown Norfolk used to be underwater. But now, of course, you only know that when it rains, because when it rains, it floods. And any place is flooding, that used to be actually either marshland or part of a river or a creek. And so that's everywhere in Hampton Roads. And I also wanted to, if you look down here at the bottom, that's of course Norfolk, you see the perspective of the Dismal Swamp and how close it was. In fact, today the Dismal Swamp is only maybe about an eighth of the size that it originally was. So it used to be enormous. And that's why Nat Turner tried to escape and make his way to the Dismal Swamp because it really was not that far from Southampton County. You also see the importance and the length of the James River and how all the waterways pour out to this key point where Norfolk and Hampton are separated. That waterway that connects the two, that waterway that's the opening to the Norfolk Naval Station, that waterway is called the Hampton Roads because that name Hampton Roads means that all of the rivers and the waterways connect at that point before it bottoms out to the Chesapeake Bay, which of course flows into the Atlantic Ocean. So that's just a little history about the area. Now, uh, let me back up for just a minute and kind of give you a little perspective. We know that there are a lot, there've been a lot of stories about how all oh, slavery was dying out, you know? So eventually there was no need for a civil war. There was no need for any of these things because slavery was dying out. There were fewer slaveholders. Well, no, that's not true at all. There were fewer slaveholders, but they were owning more slaves. 
what you started to see was the emergence of corporate slavery, where there were people who owned 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, 30,000 enslaved people. And that was scattered throughout the Western part of the South. So when we talk about the emergence, the invention of the cotton gin, which made cotton a very important commodity for the, um, uh, for, the, for the United States, that cotton gin enabled poor whites, middle-class whites to become wealthy because all they needed was one enslaved man and they could very quickly become middle, middle and upper middle class because cotton was in such high demand. In fact, in 1860, cotton, cotton production was the most valuable thing that America produced. America produced seven eighths of the world's cotton production. Let me repeat that, seven eighths of the world's cotton production. The institution of slavery, the value of the people who were forced to be a part of that, the products they produced was more valuable in America than all of America's other industries combined. And so when we talk about the institution of slavery, the people who were involved, that they themselves were enslaved and the products that they produced, that was America's big business. And in Virginia, where it wasn't cotton that was king, it was tobacco that was king. But in Hampton Roads, tobacco was not king. What was king was human trafficking. The sale and the transportation of those who were sold into slavery, that was Virginia's big business. So we know that there were lots of, 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 of uh, articles and ads that came out even in the colonial period advertising uh, for runaways. Most of the runaways in the 18th century didn't run away out of the state. Typically, un unless it was borderline where, where um, Eastern North Carolina met the Hampton Roads area. But other than that, most people just simply tried to run away to cities um, or to, to larger towns. And so you saw a lot of ads saying that people were running away to Norfolk uh, or people were running away to Richmond or they were running away to Williamsburg because they could disappear in a more cosmopolitan environment. And in Norfolk, of course, you also had a lot of what they call blackjacks. And these were seamen. These were men who worked, African-American men who worked aboard ships. Some of them were simply uh, men of African descent because they worked aboard ships uh, that were British ships, uh, that were ships from one of the West Indian islands, Jamaica, Barbados, you know, coming from Cuba. So they worked aboard these ships. Um, and so some of these individuals, men especially, who escaped, tried to escape and get a job as a seaman aboard one of these vessels. And that's why they were running away. But of course, by the time we got into the 19th century, so the 1800s, that's when many people started moving out of the area and started going northward. And then this was especially because a lot of the northern states began to pass laws eliminating slavery in their territories. So let's look at the concentrations of Blacks. And, and this will be a very telling story because it really shows how the Black population who were enslaved were concentrated in our area and along this eastern seaboard, that waterway system that I told you about, but they were expanding westward as well, and they were expanding southward. So we see all the way, especially from Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Northern Georgia, there were concentrations along the eastern seaboard. In Virginia in particular, 
you see where those concentrations were. So you see, for example, right there at the fall line where those little triangles are located, that's the beginning of the mountain range, uh, the Appalachian mountain range that runs all the way along the East Coast. We call in Virginia that mountain range, the Blue Ridge Mountains. In New York, they call it the Poconos. In uh, uh, the Carolinas, they call it the Great Smokies, but it's the same uh, uh, chain of mountains. And of course, on the West Coast, they have the Rockies. So all of the fall line, they were the big producers of tobacco. We would see moving towards the waterways going east, there were areas that really were huge tobacco producers. Um, Chesterfield, Dinwiddie, that area, and of course, Essex, Caroline, especially, uh, Spotsylvania, but that area, Hanover, they were key tobacco empires. By the time you got to Southampton County, you started to see a little less tobacco production, some cotton production. But Norfolk didn't have any of that. So why was there a concentration? It was because of the maritime industry. The same thing is true of Gloucester. It wasn't because of any production. It was because of the maritime industry. That's why you have concentrations there. All right, so 1830 census. Look at how things have changed from 1790 to 1830. You not only see the population of Africans and African Americans really expanding throughout the South, but you see a, a lessening of the population of enslaved African Americans in the North. And that's because those Northern states were passing laws eliminating slavery. And of course, all the where you see this concentration in the New Orleans area, right there at the Mississippi River. A lot of people were being transported to Charleston on the East Coast and, of course, to New Orleans uh, right there on the Gulf Coast. But I want you to keep something in mind. Look at Virginia. That population density of, of African Americans did not change, even though the majority of people being sent to the lower South were coming from Virginia. And so their, their population density had reached a point such that even though there were thousands who were being sold in the domestic slave trade, they were being replaced by thousands who were being born. And we would continue to see this all the way, of course, to East Texas. That's where you had the huge cotton plantations and that helped to funnel millions of dollars into Texas. And if you know anything about American history and about the Texas annexation in 1850, this is why. It is because cotton production and the enslavement of African Americans was something that was highly desired by the officials in this country. And they wanted that territory and they wanted the products that would come from having that territory a part of the United States. But you know, we also had problems because a lot of people were escaping and they were going North. And even in the 1830s, free blacks were the object of a lot of kidnapping. In fact, if you ever saw the film, 12 Years a Slave, or read the book, 12 Years a Slave, Solomon Northup was a free black from New York who was lured to uh, Washington, DC. He was drugged and he woke up in a slave jail with all of his clothes removed and replaced with the clothing like prison clothing of, of slaves, all the slaves wore a certain type of clothing, that it was a certain color, so that people could identify them wherever they were. They were America's prisoners, forever prisoners. And so these, and so he, he woke up in, in jail and, um, and he was transported to, to the New Orleans slave market, passing through the Norfolk station and going all the way there. And so the call, there was a clarion call to 
by all the abolitionists warning of especially free blacks, but also people who had escaped to freedom in the North that these slave hunters were coming to get them. And that's because of this new Fugitive Slave Act that was passed in 1850 that created a special court that would uh, try these cases um, of those accused of being runaway slaves. The problem was that if you were black, you could not testify on your own behalf. You were denied that right because you were not really regarded as a citizen. It would take the 1857 uh, Dred Scott versus Sanford case for the Supreme Court to declare that black people are not citizens of this country because they're not human beings. And that case had to be, or that decision had to be reversed with an amendment called the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship, actually it restored citizenship to black people in this country. And so the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act also created the special court. Now, presumably because it was, was more paperwork involved, if you found a person guilty of being a fugitive slave, the judge was paid $10. But if he found that the person was not a fugitive slave, he was paid $5. And so this differential in pay resulted in abolitionists galvanizing themselves to ensure that people would not be identified as fugitive slaves. And you had actually a lot of um, states, especially Massachusetts, pass laws saying they were not going to cooperate with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Now, I wanted to just go back to Norfolk and show you this ad. And of course it shows a st this, you know, how every week in the newspaper, you have these steamships. They tell you where they're leaving, what time they're leaving, what day they're leaving, and where they're going. And so we can trace and compare the accounts that William Still was giving with this schedule. And it helps us to understand at least those who are leaving aboard the steamships. But you had many others who were leaving aboard schooners. And, and to just kind of give you some perspective, Higgins Wharf down at the bottom is where the steamships were docked. And Higgins Wharf is pretty much where the baseball stadium is located in Norfolk. So it's right off of Waterside Drive. It's actually on the older street called Water Street. Market Square, that's where Waterside is. And, um, and Main Street. And that's the air, that was the center also of the black community. The Norfolk Ferry Dock, that's the same place that the ferry docks today. So if you go to Waterside and you want to go over to Portsmouth, that's the ferry. That's, that's exactly where the ferry dock. And on the other side of Portsmouth on High Street and North Street, that's also where the ferry dock in Portsmouth. And so a lot of people who escaped through the Dismal Swamp and made their way to Portsmouth got aboard the ferry that was manned in some cases entirely by enslaved Black men, made their way over to Norfolk and got aboard one of the ships and escaped. We also know that Scott's, Scott's and Tanner's Creek, so a lot of people actually got aboard schooners that were arranged for them and escaped there. But we're finding that also further inland, um, past Higgins Wharf going, going towards St. Mary's Basilica today, which is off of Tidewater Drive, that is also where enslaved people got aboard schooners and left. And so again, to, as a reminder, this is an example of one of the other steamships, the Philadelphia that plied the waterways in, uh, in and around this area. Now, I want to tell you one last story about these three people. Um, and actually, it's, it's four people. So William and Charles Davis, brothers, and their sister was Clarissa Davis. And they were actually owned by different people. But they had arranged to escape aboard a schooner called the Ellen Barnes that went back and forth between Norfolk and New Bedford. But for whatever reason, 
Clarissa missed the ship. Her two brothers left reluctantly without her in 1854, and, it, and she made it over to Norfolk and got together with two individuals, William Bagnall, who was a white man who worked as a conductor, and John Minkins, who was a steward aboard the city of Richmond to help her to escape. And she talks about in her account how she hid for 75 days in a miserable coop and eventually uh, was able to get aboard the ship when there was a huge thunderstorm. And the two men that I mentioned helped to dress her as a man and got her aboard the ship. And she escaped and made her way to New Bedford. And that's where she lay, that's where she remained. <coughs> she and, and her brothers were members of the Colored Methodist Church in Portsmouth, a church that later became known as Emmanuel AME Church. And that church was actually known as a, a magnet for people who wanted their freedom. And many people actually escaped from slavery who were members of that church. Another man who was a member of that church, he and his wife, Robert Irving. Robert later adopted the, the alias of Sheridan Ford. And he lived in Portsmouth. Um, he and his father worked at the, um, at the Portsmouth Navy Hospital. He worked as, in construction. Um, and we know where he probably lived, on Dinwiddie Street with his owner. Um, he was hired out. This is where he was hired out, he and his father. Uh, this is a picture of what the Naval Hospital looked like in the 1850s. He knew his, his uh, uh, future wife, Julia Ann. They married in 1845. The person who married them was her owner, John Hodges. Um, and John Hodges actually performed the wedding ceremony in his house and allowed the two to live in the basement of his house. And that's where they, they had their marriage supper. That's where they had their three kids. Uh, but according to the accounts, um, the general and his wife worked uh, uh, Sheridan Ford's wife horribly. Um, and he, actually, he complained bitterly about her treatment. We know that uh, Sheridan Ford uh, had two very good friends, Charles Bracey who was a free black and David Johnson, who was enslaved, who kept him up and informed with everything. And this is a picture of the house in which they lived. And if you look at the bottom floor, that was the basement in which they lived. It's a private residence today. Well, Julia and Robert would have three children, three boys, Robert Jr., George, and Frank. Uh, later on, Robert and George would move up to New York City and they would eventually die. Frank stayed in Portsmouth and um, lived long enough to be reunited with his father. But let me tell you what happened. So in 1854, in November, his owner, Robert's owner was about to sell him. He heard about it and he escaped. And he tried to secure the freedom of his wife and three children. But John Hodges, her owner, had heard about him escaping. And he took Julia and the three children and locked them up in the, one of the slave jails in Norfolk. And Robert tried desperately for two months to try to get them out. But pretty soon he knew he was going to be uh, found out. And he got aboard the steamship with the help of John Minkins and went up to Philadelphia and made contact with William Still and then went to New Bedford where numerous other Portsmouth natives were living um, under the guise of free people and they all adopted aliases. Clarissa Davis was now known as Mary Armstead. Robert Irvin was now known as Sheridan Ford. But the 1855 yellow fever epidemic hit and John Hodges died and his descendants sold Julia and the three children to a relative in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And unfortunately, that of course resulted in 
him not knowing and Sheridan Ford not knowing what happened to his children. He tried desperately to find his wife and children. Eventually he gave up in 1863 and he married Clarissa Davis. Two years later, he got word that his wife and three children were safe and had returned to Portsmouth, but it was too late. He was already married and he and his new wife had two children. And of course, she, thinking she would never see her husband again, remarried as well. Well, Sheridan Ford visited Portsmouth twice after freedom, after the end of the Civil War. The second time he visited, he, it was in 1895, and he gave his son, he had done so well, he owned two houses, he had $1,200 in the bank, which is like almost $100,000 today. He owned, a, he owned several businesses. And he gave each of his children a very expensive gold watch. And he told Frank, his son, take this, this is nothing common, meaning this is very expensive, but this is an indication that you will be one of my heirs when I die. And then he turned and what well, he said to his son, son, I can't come here anymore. It's too painful. And then he turns to his first wife, Julia, and he says to her, it's too painful when I look at you and my children and I realize the life that I lost, I can't come here. He said, had I not been forced to leave, we would have celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary this year. He left forever, going back to New Bedford and two years later, he died. And so after he died and after Clarissa Davis died, Frank didn't hear anything about his inheritance. And so his two half siblings refused to share the inheritance. And fortunately for us, he filed a lawsuit in Massachusetts and claimed he was one of the heirs to his father's estate. But the Massachusetts court ruled that because Massachusetts did not recognize slavery, then the marriage was not valid and therefore he was not an heir. But this case gave us all of this information that I just gave you about Sheridan Ford and Julia Ann and Frank and Clarissa Davis. Otherwise, I would not have known that particular heartbreaking but very important story. And so historians love to find out more information. These are the two people that Clarissa Davis, now known as Mary, and Sheridan Ford had uh, Leonard and Margaret. This is a, an image that um, gives you an idea of what Norfolk looked like in 1885. And so you can project back uh, 30 years and, and know that this is pretty much what it looked like at that time, minus some of the telephone wiring and so forth. But in this time period, this is what the wharves looked like. They were dirty, they were filthy, they were filled with all kinds of products. That's the site. So today, that's not what it looks like. Today, you see this wonderful baseball stadium and you see the train station. But at that time, it was a very busy uh, water wharf. But I wanted to, to tell you about this particular woman. She was a part of a group of people who were contacted by those who are living in John Hodge's house today. They tracked down the descendants of Frank Irving and had an opportunity to bring them to Portsmouth, to host them in their home and to have them visit Emmanuel AME Church, that same church that her ancestors worshiped in. And of course, this was their first time to learn about this incredible story of their ancestors. And so this is a picture of William Still, who wrote this incredible book called The Underground Railroad. He was one of the few station masters that not only collected all these stories and kept them, in fact, during the Civil War, he hid his accounts in a cemetery for fear that if the Confederates overran Philadelphia, they might find his work 
and they might be able to track down all the enslaved people and force them back into slavery. But he wrote all these accounts because one day when he was interviewing people who had come through his station, there was a young man who came from where his parents were from. He was actually born in a free state, but his parents had been enslaved and they escaped. And he found out that this young man was older than he was. And as he talked and talked and talked, he found out that this was his long lost brother who had been sold away before, just before his parents escaped. And they had been looking and looking and looking for him. And he realized that he had to do the same thing for other people that he was able to do for himself. And that is through his writings, he was hoping that people would reconnect. In the case of Sheridan Ford's family, it took almost 200 years for them to reconnect. But in the case of some of the other families, they reconnected shortly after the end of slavery. And of course, his account tells us that there were 763 freedom seekers who passed through his station between 1852 and 1859. And that was an incredible story to really learn about, about all these accounts. And so just looking at his account, these aren't all the people who escaped. This is just a sliver of the people who escaped. We know that 102 out of that 285 that he talks about, 102 came from Norfolk. Half that number came from Richmond and then fewer Petersburg, et cetera, et cetera. So Norfolk really was the hub just, just in looking at this account. Now, there were people who escaped on smaller ships like the skiff. Um, and in fact, one of the people, Robert Emerson was the brother of Jeffrey Wilson who wrote this important um, column in the Portsmouth Star called the Colored Notes. Jeffrey Wilson looks, if you look at a picture of him, he looks just like his owner. It looks like father and son, which from basically my research says that's a high probability it was. Robert Emerson eventually um, made it up to Toronto, Canada. And after the Civil War, he came back to this country, but he did not come back to Portsmouth. He ended up going to, um, um, to San Francisco and he got a job with um, William Hearst working on the newspaper uh, in San Francisco. And Jeffrey Wilson actually has some pictures showing him visiting his brother around the end of the 19th century. There were other people that I found who continued to live in Canada, such as Isabella Pugh and Stebney Swan, but they all escaped aboard this tiny little ship. And we also know that there were efforts to find enslaved people. And if you go to downtown Norfolk and you go to Waterside, you will see the picture on a marker. And that event actually happened on that site. Alfred Fountain was a captain who built a secret compartment aboard his schooner, and he was able to secret 22 enslaved people away, even though there were um, accounts that he was involved with the Underground Railroad. And we know that there were night watchmen, there were constables who were constantly working as slave catchers. And so some of the people successfully escaped but others were actually captured. And of course, I mentioned that the Dismal Swamp was an important route for a lot of people. Now, there were a handful of people who actually stayed inside the swamp, while the majority of people simply used it as a way to hide as they made their way slowly to the Norfolk Harbor via Portsmouth. Um, and if you're interested, please visit the Dismal Swamp to learn a lot more about these freedom seekers, as well as about the Maroons and the Maroon camps that are in the swamp that um, Dan Sayers, who's an archeologist, has actually found at least 20 different Maroon communities within the swamps. Well, when they got to the North, there were many places, many of you have perhaps heard about all the white abolitionists 
who helped. But the reality is actually the opposite, that the majority of people who worked secretly to help escape slaves, these freedom seekers, were free blacks in the North. And these free black communities in Philadelphia and, and in Chester County in Pennsylvania and in New York and Boston and New Bedford, these were the people who helped to give aid and comfort and security and protection to these enslaved people. Many of the white abolitionists risked their lives. Many of them raised money to help but it was within the black community that these individuals found protection. And so I wanted you to see where New Bedford and where Boston was you know, relative to each other. And of course, the easy way to connect these two was through the waterways. And New Bedford actually became the, the enslaved, enslaved person's haven um, because the people in New Bedford were kind of different. Unlike Boston that had a lot of people connected to the slave trade, New Bedford was a whaling town. And for whatever reason, the people in New Bedford did not like slavery. They protected, the whites of that town protected the enslaved population. And the enslaved population uh, or the people who, were, who had been enslaved, that population grew. And in fact, it was such a strong, powerful population that Frederick Douglass asked that the 54th Massachusetts Regiment be mustered in in New Bedford, Massachusetts, because he thought, who better to fight for freedom than the freedom seekers? And that's why New Bedford was chosen. And this is a image, it kind of, New Bedford also very much resembled the Norfolk Harbor in the way that the buildings were constructed and the numbers of ships that were coming and going. And so I want to just conclude um, my discussion and I'm just gonna slide past this by, by talking about some recent information that's been uncovered and that is St. Mary's Basilica in Norfolk. And if you look at these images, they have recently, over the past year and a half, discovered there's a tunnel that was built. And the church, this new church that was built in 1858 was built on top of this tunnel. And they made sure that the architecture of the church did not destroy the tunnel, that they altered it to not destroy the tunnel. And there, there's nothing in the city records to show why that tunnel is there. So it wasn't built by the city, it was built by other people. And we have found that um, those other people were connected to Haiti because St. Patrick's Church and then St. Mary's was primarily filled with people who had left from Haiti during the Haitian Revolution in the 1790s. And they, many of them are, began arriving in Norfolk in 18, excuse me, in 1792. And that included a woman by the name of Mary Ogilvy, who later married a man also from Haiti. Although Mary was her, only her father was from Haiti. Her mother was from Virginia. Her mother was a free black, so was her father. But Mary married a man who came from Haiti. Um, and, um, and she was the one who actually got the plans for the USS Merrimack, which became the CSS Virginia, the first ironclad ship. And she got those plans all the way to Washington, DC and to Gideon Wells, who was the secretary of the Navy to prove that, that the Confederates were indeed constructing a, uh, an ironclad vessel. And this is what helped to speed up the production of the USS Monitor. That, and, and of course, we know that the famous ironclad battle happened right there at the Hampton Roads uh, in 1862. Well, Mary um, uh, purchased a young man from Haiti named Mark de Morty for $350. And she kept him almost the age of 21 as a slave. Now, what's interesting is that there's no evidence that she held him 
officially, I mean, officially, yes, as a slave, but he was actually allowed considerable freedom. You have to understand, Virginia passed a law in the early uh, 1800s that said if you were recently freed, that you had a year to get out of the state. And if you didn't, you would become a slave again. So it appears that she held him long enough so that he could be his own man. Well, during the time he was a teenager, he began to work with a man named Henry Lundy. Henry Lundy was a free black who helped hundreds of people escape from slavery. And so it appears that De Morty, connected to the church, was working arm in arm with Lundy to help hundreds of people escape. And it appears that that tunnel was an important device that they used to help people escape. And here's a picture of De Morty, who ended up having to flee Norfolk because he was associated with helping people escape and ended up being an important part of the abolitionist community in, um, in Boston. And so I want to conclude by inviting you to read my book, which is really only a brief account of some of these amazing stories of people who fled through the Underground Railroad with their hearts um, uh, wrapped around the idea of securing freedom, not only for themselves, but their families. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my story. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, that was such an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time to film that for us. Thank you so much. And I've been reading some of the questions throughout the presentation and I'm happy to try to answer as many as possible. Perfect. That that sounds good. So we have uh, so many, so many comments and so many questions. I'm going to try to get through uh, probably four or five questions, if that's okay. That's fine. Perfect. So the first question that we have is from Terrence uh, Anderson, and he says, um, of all the northern cities where escaping slaves fled, what made New Bedford, Massachusetts so attractive? And could she please elaborate on Norfolk's white residents who were against slavery and who assisted slaves in their escape? So really a two part question for you, Dr. Nubi Alexander. All right. So, you know, the question about New Bedford is is a, a question that I've actually grappled with myself. Why is it that the whites in New Bedford uh, were very different than a lot of other places and seemingly um, hated anybody trying to come in and uh, take the people who were there? especially African-Americans out and return them to the South as slaves. Part of it, I think, is that um, some of the people in New Bedford actually came from the Cape Verdean Islands. Uh, and um, some of them were Portuguese, of Portuguese descent intermingled with Africans. Um, so they were kind of a different group of people. And because it was a whaling town, um, many of the people were very independent. They were not, as, in, as, as was the case in Boston, dependent on the institution of slavery to make their money. Instead, they were very independent of that particular world. Um, and so who knows what other factors played a role in that. But suffice it to say that a number of abolitionists, black abolitionists really understood that New Bedford was a place that protected people of African descent who were freedom seekers because a special church was actually moved from Boston to New Bedford by some of the black abolitionists. And it was kind of known as the fugitives church. And that church uh, helped to really be a magnet for other people uh, to resettle within that community. And in fact, uh, there were a few slaveholders who sent slave catchers up to New Bedford and they complained bitterly about how the white New, Bed New Bedfordians, if that's a word, uh, <laughs> tried to um, 
protect the, the enslaved people by ringing the church bells whenever these slave catchers came. Now, of course, they denied that particular accusation, but who knows, they may have actually done that. Uh, but that was the perception, not only uh, by African-Americans, but also by whites, that New Bedford was this very safe place uh, in which the officials and the community protected itself and protected the people who were there. Now, as to the other question, there were always whites who, in small numbers, I, I really want to emphasize that, very small numbers of whites who hated slavery as well. Uh, and if you were in the South, you especially could not open your mouth to say that you hated slavery because you were seen as a threat. And, um, and the legislature in places like Virginia passed laws that would make it a mandatory 10 year sentence. If you were caught or accused of and found guilty of helping enslaved people escape, and it came with a 10 year prison sentence, which was the same as a death sentence because nobody survived 10 years in the Virginia penitentiary. And so there were some, in fact, we see some people in the records listed as inmates in the prison, whites as well as free blacks who were helping enslaved people escape. They were at least accused and convicted of helping them escape. Many of them were skilled artisans, carpenters and brick masons and so forth. But some like William Bagnall were actually prominent in the community. And each of them had a different, perhaps personal reason for helping. Some, it was just fueled by money because of course they were going to get paid. A lot of ship captains, for example, charged anywhere from 25 to $100. If you can imagine that's thousands of dollars today. They charge all that money to say, okay, I'll help you. Um, I'll give you passage on this ship in exchange for this money. And you may say, wow, that was a big money-making venture. Yes, it was, but if they got caught, they lost everything perhaps even their lives. Uh, William Bayless was a, uh, a ship's captain. He, he was uh, from Delaware and he was captured and actually uh, was put in prison right before the, the Civil War began. Um, and somehow the family was able to get him out of prison after about three or four years. It was even reported in the newspapers that he died while in the prison. And he was uh, very ill when he left the prison after just three or four years. But that's kind of an example of, you know, there were whites with different motivations. Um, helping people escape. William Bagnall was actually um, uh, acu not accused, but the explanation that Clarissa Davis gave to why he helped people in Norfolk, uh, she claimed that his wife was actually uh, a black woman who was enslaved. Now, when we look in the records, she's listed as white, but when he died, the newspapers referred to her, her as his consort which you may say, well, it's kind of the same word as a wife, but not really. Most people were not listed as consorts uh, if they were indeed that person's spouse, uh, a legal spouse. And so that may have been his motivation for helping. Thank you so much. So we have about uh, five minutes left for questions. We're gonna try to get through two of these. So Bertha asks, where was the slave market located in Norfolk? The slave market was located five feet from where the Confederate monument was located on Commercial Avenue. And so part of my advocacy for removing the monument was that that monument was not just placed there by chance. Uh, that was a marker of power. And uh, the slave market represented money and power for many of the whites in the area. And uh, so a lot of these sites, such as the slave jails, uh, City Hall is built on the sites where those slave jails were formerly located. I believe that there was a reason. Thank you so much, ma'am. And last question that we have time for from uh, Andrea. Dr. Nubi Alexander, this information is truly amazing. Where can we get more information 
and resources about this amazing topic? Um, well, um, the book that I wrote is one source. It just really gives you a slither of the information. Uh, there are many other um, accounts. I'm currently actually working on an article uh, that will reveal some of this new information that we found out about St. Mary's Basilica. Um, but um, you will find, for example, uh, in the book, Fugitives Gibraltar, um, a, an account of what happened in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, so I would say stay tuned. Uh, there are many other books coming out uh, that actually talk about the maritime industry. There's one coming out next year uh, or later on this year that's published by the University of Massachusetts in which I talk about the Underground Railroad here, but they're talking about all of the maritime industries along the Eastern seaboard that um, involve the Underground Railroad. Well, thank you so much, ma'am. And so Dr. Nubi Alexander, thank you very much for that enlightening and interesting presentation. I know that our audience got a lot out of it and hopefully it will spur your additional research on the part of many of the students that are currently listening. As a token of our appreciation for your time and talents, the Hampton Roads Committee of 200 plus men will donate $500 to Norfolk State University's College of Liberal Arts. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I know that uh, uh, we are so excited about that particular donation and uh, we will continue to do research and be happy to share that through a whole series of programs. In fact, the City of Norfolk's Visitor Center is working jointly with us on this important story, the Underground Railroad, to make sure it becomes a permanent part of our landscape. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm going to go ahead and, and pull back uh, Vice Mayor Gray. Uh, as we present the 200 uh, plus